Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2024. Welcome to lesson number nine, The Foundation of God's Government, ready for teaching on June 1. The author of the series of lessons on the Great Controversy is Pastor Mark Finlay, and your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, May 25. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the import of these lessons that we're reading this quarter. The fact that there is a disaster that has occurred in the past that is ongoing, but because of your grace and your love and the salvation offered through Jesus, there will be an end to this disaster with the salvation of those who put their faith in you. And as we study this lesson this week, as we look to Jesus as our Saviour, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us in our study. May the words that we read this week be a blessing to ourselves and to those we associate with. And today I'd like to pray for Dolores in Las Vegas and Andrew Green. And thank you, Andrew, for your prayers and for Felix Amparo and for Ignacio Navarrete. Thank you very much for your contact uh, to me regarding um, the benefit to you of uh, these readings of the Adult Bible Study Guide. And Lord, as we study your word this week, I pray that we will not only be blessed, but show that blessing to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our memory text this week comes from Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's read that again, Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Through intensive Bible study, Adventists came to understand the significance of the law in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Looking into the heart of God's law, they also discovered the significance of the Sabbath, the fourth commandment. In fact, this commandment, more than any other, clearly identifies God as our creator, the foundation of all true worship, a theme that will be especially relevant in the final days of Earth's history, as we read in Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, who made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulphur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise for ever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image, or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God, who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Satan's aim from the beginning has been to thwart the worship of God through undermining the law of God. He knows that to offend in one point means to be guilty of all, as it says in James 2.10. So he encourages people to transgress God's law. Satan hates the Sabbath because it reminds people of the Creator and how he is to be worshipped. But it also is enshrined in God's law in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Because the law is what defines sin, as long as people seek to be faithful to God, then his law must continue to be valid, including the Sabbath commandment. 
The aim of this lesson is to show the link between the sanctuary, God's law, the Sabbath, and the coming crisis over the mark of the beast. We also will explore the relevance of the Sabbath to an end-time generation. And if you want to do some reading, chapters 25 to 27 of The Great Controversy go with this lesson. Sunday, May 26, The Sanctuary and the Law Read Revelation 11.19, Exodus 25.16, Exodus 31.18 and Revelation 12.17. What do these verses indicate was in the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place of the sanctuary? Revelation 11.19 Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of his Covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. And Exodus 25.16 Then put in the Ark the tablets of the covenant law which I will give you. And Exodus 31.18 When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. And Revelation 12:17 Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. The day of atonement was a day of judgment. All of Israel was commanded to take part in this event by repentance, soul-searching, and refraining from all work, as we see in Leviticus 23, verses 29 to 31. Those who do not deny themselves on that day must be cut off from their people. I will destroy from among their people anyone who does any work on that day. You shall do no work at all. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come, wherever you live. On this day alone, the high priest would enter the most holy place to make atonement for sin. There, in the innermost apartment of the sanctuary, was the Ark of the Covenant. Within the Ark was God's Ten Commandment Law, written on tables of stone. The golden cover of the Ark was called the Mercy Seat, where blood was sprinkled to cleanse the sanctuary from sin. God's presence was manifest in Shekinah glory above the Mercy Seat. Every sacrifice offered revealed God's mercy towards sinful human beings. But the Day of Atonement shows that sin is remembered until the Day of Judgment, as we read in Hebrews 10.3, and that it could really be removed only through faith in the blood of Christ to cleanse from sin, as we read in 1 Peter 1.18 and 19. Let's look at that one first, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that ye were redeemed, from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And Hebrews 10 verse 3, but those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. There, in the presence of God, mercy and justice beautifully combined. Looking into the heavenly sanctuary, the Apostle John saw, as he records in Revelation 11.19, the temple of God opened and the Ark of the Covenant revealed. The Great Controversy adds this comment on page 434. Within the Holy of Holies, in the sanctuary in heaven, the divine law is sacredly enshrined. The law that was spoken by God himself amid the thunders of Sinai and written with his own finger on the tables of stone. The law of God in the sanctuary in heaven is the great original, of which the precepts inscribed upon the tables of stone and recorded by Moses in the Pentateuch were an unerring transcript. Those who arrived at an understanding of this important point were thus led to see the sacred, unchanging character of the divine law. End of quote. As the early Adventist believers studied the Bible's teachings on the sanctuary, they realized the significance of the law of God and the Sabbath in the heart of God's law. 
They reasoned that if the law of God was pictured in the Ark of the Covenant in the heavenly sanctuary, it certainly could not have been done away with at the cross. And so to finish today, think about the Sabbath, which at 1,000 miles an hour comes to us every week without exception. What should that tell us about the importance of the doctrine of creation? What other doctrine has such a powerful and reoccurring reminder? Monday, May 27, The Immutability of God's Law Read Matthew 5, verses 17 to 18, Psalm 111, 7 and 8, Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14, 1 John 5, verse 3, and Proverbs 28, verse 9. What do these Bible passages teach regarding the Christian's relationship to the law? So let's begin at Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And Psalm 111 verses 7 to 8, The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established for ever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. And Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. And First John, chapter 5, Verse 3, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. And Proverbs 28, verse 9, if anyone turns a deaf ear to my instruction, even their prayers are detestable. Seventh-day Adventists follow in the footsteps of the Protestant reformers who upheld the sanctity of God's law. Note this powerful affirmation of John Wesley from Upon Our Lord's Sermon on the Mount, a discourse by John Wesley in his sermons and anthology, and this comes from page 208 and 209. The ritual or ceremonial law delivered by Moses to the children of Israel, containing all the injunctions and ordinances which related to the old sacrifices and service of the temple, our Lord indeed did come to destroy, to dissolve, and utterly abolish. But the moral law, contained in the Ten Commandments and enforced by the prophets, he did not take away. It was not the design of his coming to revoke any part of this. This is a law which never can be broken, which stands fast as the faithful witness in heaven. Every part of this law must remain in force upon all mankind and in all ages, as not depending either on time or place or any other circumstances liable to change, but on the nature of God and the nature of man and their unchangeable relation to each other. End of quote. Compare Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7, with Romans 7, 11 to 12, Psalm 19, verses 7 to 11, Psalm 89, verse 14, and Psalm 119, verse 142, and 172. What do these verses tell us about the relationship between God's law and God's character? First of all, Exodus 34, beginning at verse 5. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth 
generation. And Romans 7, beginning at verse 11, For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. And Psalm 19, beginning at verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. And Psalm 89 verse 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. And Psalm 119 verse 142, your righteousness is everlasting, and your law is true. And verse 172, May my tongue sing of your word, for all your commands are righteous. Since the law of God is a transcript of his character, the foundation of his throne, and the moral basis for humanity, Satan hates it. None could fail to see that if the earthly sanctuary was a figure or pattern of the heavenly, the law deposited in the ark on earth was an exact transcript of the law in the ark in heaven, writes Ellen White in The Great Controversy, page 435. We continue, and that an acceptance of the truth concerning the heavenly sanctuary involved an acknowledgement of the claims of God's law and the obligation of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Here was the secret of the bitter and determined opposition to the harmonious exposition of the scriptures that revealed the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. End of quote. And so to finish the day... What are reasons people often give to argue that we no longer are obligated to keep the Ten Commandments? What do you think is really behind it? Tuesday, May 28, The Sabbath and the Law Read Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, Revelation 4, 11, Genesis 2, 1 to 3, and Exodus 28, verses 8 to 11. What is the relationship between creation, the Sabbath, and the law of God? First of all, Revelation 14, beginning at verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And then we read Revelation 4, verse 11, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And then we read Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. And Exodus 20 Beginning at verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. 
Creation speaks of our value in God's sight. We are not alone in the universe, some speck of cosmic dust, nor are we a genetic accident. In other words, the common scientific scenario of life's origins, which has been picked up by the news media and popular culture, presents a view of our origins that is in every way incompatible with the biblical account. We are here because Jesus created us, and he is worthy of our worship not only because he created us, but also because he redeemed us. Creation and redemption are at the heart of all true worship. Therefore, the Sabbath is vital to understanding the plan of salvation. The Sabbath speaks of a Creator's care and a Redeemer's love. At the conclusion of the Creation Week, God rested in the beauty and majesty of the world He had made. He also rested as an example for us. The Sabbath is a weekly pause to praise the One who made us. As we worship on the Sabbath, we open our hearts to receive the special blessing He placed in that day only, and in no other day. The Sabbath points us to a Creator who loved us too much to abandon us when we drifted from His purpose for us. The Sabbath is an eternal symbol of our rest in Him. It is a special sign of loyalty to the Creator, as we read in Ezekiel 20, in verse 12, also I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between us so that they would know that I, the Lord, made them holy. And then Ezekiel 20, verse 20, keep my Sabbaths holy that they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. It is a symbol of rest, not of works, of grace, not of legalism, of assurance, not of condemnation, of depending upon God for salvation, not on ourselves. True Sabbath rest is the rest of grace in the loving arms of the one who created us, the one who redeemed us, and the one who is coming again for us. The message of Revelation 14, God's end-time message for the world, calls people to rest in His love and care each Sabbath. It calls us to remember the One who created us and give Him glory. Keeping the Sabbath also is a connecting link between the perfection of Eden and the glory of the new heavens and the new earth to come. It reminds us that one day the splendours of Eden will be restored. And so to finish the day, most Seventh-day Adventists have faced the charge of being legalistic and that charge is usually connected with our keeping the Sabbath. Discuss the Sabbath as a symbol of redemption and righteousness by faith. Why would obeying God's command to rest lead people to think we are trying to work our way to heaven? Wednesday, May 29, The Mark of the Beast. Read Revelation 12, verses 12 and 17, and chapter 13, verse 7. How do these texts reveal Satan's wrath? Why is the devil so angry with God's end-time people? Revelation 12, beginning at verse 12. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. And then verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. And chapter 13 and verse 7. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them, and it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Revelation 12 outlines the cosmic conflict between Christ and Satan down through the ages. 
It climaxes with Satan's final attack on the people of God. Revelation 13 introduces the dragon's two allies, the beast from the sea and the beast from the land. These two powers join him in making war on God's people. Read Revelation 13, verses 4, 8, 12 and 15, and Revelation 14, verse 7 and 9 to 11. Also have a look at Revelation 15, 4, 16 to 19, 20, 20 and verse 4, and 22, verse 9. What one key theme appears in all these verses? First of all, Revelation 13, 4. People worship the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worship the beast and asked, Who is like the beast who can wage war against it? And verse 8, All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. And verse 12, it exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. And verse 15, the second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. And Revelation 14 verse 7, he said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea and the springs of water. And verses 9 to 11, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulphur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise for ever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. And we'll also look at Revelation 15 verse 4. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And chapter 16, verse 2, the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. And chapter 19, verse 20, but the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulphur. And chapter 20 verse 4, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years, and chapter 22, verse 9. But he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. Note the contrast. Either people worship the Creator or they worship something else. The Creator is worthy of worship, we read in Revelation 5 and verse 9. The controversy between Christ and Satan began in heaven over worship. Isaiah 14 verse 14 reads, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. Satan wants the worship belonging only to the Creator. According to Revelation 13, he succeeds through the activity of the land beast in Revelation 13 verse 4. A comparison with Daniel 7 shows that this land beast is the same as the little horn that seeks to change times and laws and exercises authority for 1,260 days, that is, for 1,260 years, as is recorded in Daniel 7.25. And we compare that with Revelation 
13 and verse 5. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. And we saw that in lesson 6. The only part of God's law, the Ten Commandments, dealing with time is the fourth commandment. This church has attempted to change the day of worship from Saturday, the seventh day, to Sunday, the first day of the week. For an earthly power to seek to change the day of worship, the seventh day Sabbath, which God himself gave as a sign of authority in Exodus 31.13 and Ezekiel 20 verses 12 and 20, is an attempt to usurp divine authority at the most basic level possible. Exodus 31 verse 13 reads, Say to the Israelites, You must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. In Ezekiel 20 and verse 12, Also I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between us, so that they would know that I, the Lord, made them holy. And then Ezekiel 20 verse 20, Keep my Sabbaths holy, that they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. On this point, then, is the focus of the final conflict over true and false worship. For this reason, Revelation identifies people who are faithful to God as those who keep the commandments of God. And we read that in Revelation 12, 17 and 14, verse 12. This includes the seventh day Sabbath, not Sunday. Those who refuse the final call of the three angels to worship God on his holy day and who worship the beast on his counterfeit Sabbath, Sunday, will receive the mark of the beast. And we'll study more about that in Lesson 11. But Isaiah 58, 13 reads, If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honourable, and if you honour it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words... Thursday, May 30, The Three Angels' Messages In Revelation 14.7, the first angel cries with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Heaven's appeal is for us to give our supreme allegiance and heartfelt worship to the Creator, in light of impending judgment. The second angel declares in Revelation 14.8, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon represents a fallen apostate religious system that has rejected the message of the first angel in favour of a false system of worship. That's why Revelation fourteen nine to 11 warns against worshipping the beast and his image. Two opposing choices are presented here, worship of the Creator or worship of the beast. Every person on planet Earth will make their final irrevocable decision over who has their total allegiance, Jesus or Satan. Read Revelation 14, verse 12. What are the two identifying characteristics of those who refuse to worship the beast? Why are both vitally important? Revelation 14.12 This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. God will have an end-time people who are loyal to him in the face of the greatest opposition and fiercest persecution in the history of the world. Through the gift of Christ's righteousness, they will live grace-filled, obedient lives. Worshipping the Creator stands in direct opposition to worshipping the beast and is expressed in keeping the commandments of God. This final conflict over allegiance to Christ or allegiance to the beast power centres in worship 
And at the heart of this great controversy between good and evil is the Sabbath. These committed followers of the Saviour will not only have faith in Jesus, but will also have the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is a faith so deep, so trusting, so committed, that all the demons in hell and all the trials on earth cannot shake it. It is a faith that trusts when it cannot see, believes when it cannot reason why, and hopes when it cannot understand. This faith of Jesus is itself a gift we receive by faith. It will carry us through the crisis ahead. When the final crisis breaks and we face an economic boycott, persecution, imprisonment and death itself, the faith of Jesus will carry us through earth's final hours until Jesus returns. And so to finish today, how is God preparing your faith today for what is coming in the future? Friday, May 31, Further Thought From the Great Controversy, page 455, we read, In the absence of Bible testimony in their favour, many with unwearying persistence urged, forgetting how the same reasoning had been employed against Christ and his apostles, why do not our great men understand this Sabbath question? But few believe as you do. It cannot be that you are right and that all the men of learning in the world are wrong. To refute these arguments, it was needful only to cite the teachings of the Scriptures and the history of the Lord's dealings with His people in all ages. End of quote. And then from the same book, page 449. Christians of past generations observed the Sunday, supposing that in so doing they were keeping the Bible Sabbath. And there are now true Christians in every church, not excepting the Roman Catholic communion, who honestly believe that Sunday is the Sabbath of divine appointment. God accepts their sincerity of purpose and their integrity before him. But when Sunday observance shall be enforced by law and the world shall be enlightened concerning the obligation of the true Sabbath, then whoever shall transgress the command of God to obey a precept which has no higher authority than that of Rome will thereby honour popery above God. He is paying homage to Rome and to the power which enforces the institution ordained by Rome. He is worshipping the beast and his image. As men then reject the institution which God has declared to be the sign of his authority, and honour in its stead that which Rome has chosen as the token of her supremacy, they will thereby accept the sign of allegiance to Rome, the mark of the beast. And it is not until the issue is thus plainly set before the people, and they are brought to choose between the commandments of God and the commandments of men, that those who continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, the world is changing so quickly, so dramatically. Why must we always be vigilant so that the last day events don't catch us unprepared? Two, how does an understanding of the judgment and the law of God harmonise with the fact that we are saved by grace alone? 3. What are ways you can witness to those who don't grasp the significance of the true Sabbath and sincerely keep Sunday, the first day of the week? And 4. What dangers lie in the union of church and state powers? How, as Christians, are we to relate to the government? And our mission story this week is read by Percy. It's titled Running from Church, Part 2, by Andrew McChesney. After two young refugees gave their hearts to Jesus in a European city, they began to plead with their mother to consider Jesus. Mother, don't you want to be saved? asked 20-year-old Rosen. His mother, Anelia, 
erupted like a volcano. I will never leave my religion, she yelled, pounding on a table. I'll keep my religion until I die. Her 22-year-old son, Sergei, spoke about how Jesus was crucified for people's sins and resurrected on the third day. It's impossible that he was resurrected, Anilia said. If you believe in Jesus and die, you also will be resurrected, Sergei said. One day, he read John 3.36 to his mother. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. We die, he said to his mother, but when Jesus returns, we will be raised from the graves. My son, how will we be raised from the graves? she asked. We It was the biggest question on her mind. How was it possible to be resurrected and live forever? As she listened to her sons, Bible verses that had once confused her began to make sense. She began to understand what Paul, the man who had first invited the family to church, had read to them from the Bible and what she had heard about Jesus during her first church visit. Joy filled her heart and Anelia later understood that the Holy Spirit had entered her heart. Soon, Anelia acknowledged Jesus as her Saviour. When she did that, a desire filled her to spend time with him and to attend worship services at church. Then her 15-year-old daughter was baptised. Anelia had skipped the baptisms of her two sons, but she went to her daughter's baptism. She congratulated her afterward. Mother, your turn is next, her daughter said. Sir Jay gave Bible studies to his mother, and she also studied the Bible on her own. A thirst grew in her heart to live for Christ. Then the day came, when she was 47, that she gave her heart to Jesus in baptism. It was with great joy, she said in an interview. I cannot describe my joy. It was the first time in 47 years that I had such joy. I believed and accepted Jesus Christ. Today, Anelia is 48 and a missionary to her people. Her husband has accepted the Bible, and even his parents back in their native country are keeping the Sabbath. Anelia also gives Bible studies to her community. Once I'd wanted to run away from the church, but now a desire has filled me to run to church, she said. The Holy Spirit brought me to God.